I will give an overview about the standard search for supersymmetry and uh, compressed uh, search analysis uh, at CMS detector. So, um, in the next slide, I, I start giving an overview of the standard model. Uh, we know that uh, the standard model has successfully um, testing the the your this prediction his, its predictions and uh, your success successful uh, came from fact that pre, your some some predictions have found in in experiments at CERN tie uh, such a um, predictions are for example the W and the bosons in 1981 and uh, the top quark discovery but the top quark discovery was found uh, in at uh, Fermilab and Higgs boson at CERN. We know that uh, the standard model group symmetry is as uh, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 where the the first group means uh, it's related to the chromodynamic quantum chromodynamic key and the second group is co is related to the uh, isospin and uh, the third group uh, hypercharge so on on the the left i i i show uh, <laughs> a basically short um for the standard model Lagrangian, the, co the, the covariant form, um, where are all the field matters, the Higgs boson, the, all the Yukawa couplings, and, uh, and all couplings between Higgs and uh, the bosons in the standard model. Um, on the left, we can see a basic illustration about all the particles known so far and the last piece found in 2012, the Higgs boson. Uh, in the next slide, okay, the standard model has been su successfully in, in, in predictions. All you, basically, almost all your prediction was found at, uh, in, exp in several experiments, but it it uh, makes a uh, make it makes a, we answer uh, we ask some questions, but standard model would be a final theory to describe nature. So far, we know that the the answer for this question is no, because inside standard model we have a, a lot of open questions. For example, we we know that that uh, the Higgs boson mass without a procedure called fine tuning has quadra quadratic divergences, making the Higgs mass several orders larger than the predicted, th that uh, that's uh, large, uh, large ordinance, um, larger than the observed in data. We know that uh, inside the standard model, we don't see a particle that could explain the dark matter that, con that uh, m where the dark matter makes up 22% of the universe and uh, five per five per four five percent correspond to the visible matter that we know as atoms, galaxies, and another. Another open question is concerned about the unification of the coupling constants. As we know that uh, each interaction, each force, has a coupling constant related the heat, the electromagnetic in this plot is the alpha one, the um, alpha two star it stands to the weak force and alpha three to a strong force uh inside the standard model we see that this these constants in high energy energies dot don't get together in a common point so this is a, it's some kind of questions open in standard model but the, uh, there are others as this um a symmetry, uh, some kind of asymmetries. Um, okay, 
so in the next slide uh, but before I uh, get the next slide, we, we can see would be some some other theory that could uh, help uh, understand or answer these open questions inside this standard model. So there as there are some couples there's so uh, there's some theories uh, available in the market. One of them is supersymmetry. That I can say that is one is a very active attractive extension of the standard model. Why? This is very first because it's uh, supersymmetry uh, makes us uh, in a natural way rep uh, reply some of these open questions inside the standard, mo standard model. For example, the first uh, uh, answer is for the that Higgs divergence for Higgs mass with with the new spectrum of super partners in the supersymmetry models you can cancel it in a in a exact way these contributions for the Higgs masses making the Higgs mass stable and finite um, the other the other the other answer is for the dark matter candidate Inside the supersymmetric models, you can find a particle candidate. In most of these scenarios, this particle candidate is the neutralino, LSP. What a, the LSP stands for lightest supersymmetric particle. Um, the other point, the other answer for the in, for the a coupling, uh, the unification of the coupling constants is that the with this um, new spectrum of particles, they in a certain way contribute to the equation of re, uh, the for the renormalization equation of this coupling constant, make making this in high energy, high, in high energy uh, physics, in high energy. Sorry, gets a common point. So basically. As you can see on the left, you have this, the, all the, the spectrum for the supersymmetric model. On the left, you have the standard model particles. On the, on, on the right, you see it, it's supersymmetric particle. So we know that supersymmetry is a symmetry in the nature that came from in a certain way that each particle in standard model has a super partner, and each super partner has this has the same the same number quantum numbers differing to just in a in a spin. I, what what I mean here, for example, if you have a up quark inside standard model in a in supersymmetry, you have a and you have a super partner, but in up quark in standard inside the standard model, we know that it, this is a it, it is a fermion because it has a one half spin. In supersymmetry, in supersymmetry, it's uh, the part the super partner will be a boson differing in spin in one half in spin. I mean, now you have a, a quark up with a spin zero. Um, but be, beyond this, the, it, uh, this beside this, it uh, uh, super par standard model particles in, in, in it correspond to uh, its super partners. We have also the particles, the super supersymmetric particles that come from uh, that, that come from a mixture of the other super partners. I in this case. For example, as you can see, is the neutralinos and the charginos. Neutralinos um, has a family uh, comes from a family of four neutralinos, being the one, the lightest, the lightest one, and chargino has the family of two charginos. These particles come from a mixture of fultinos, xenos, and higginos. Also, in a minimal extension of the standard model, we have five Higgses 
instead of instead of one, as we see in the standard model. These five Higgs is come from because in, in inside a minimal extension, you need instead one doublet of Higgs, you you need two of two doublet two doublets of Higgs, where after the the breaking spontaneous symmetry, you have a um, you will have five degrees of freedom correspond to five de five Higgs, where the where w one of them is a Higgs like standard model. So in the next slide, we can we can before continues continue we can also ask. Supersymmetry would be a exact or a broken symmetry. The answer for that coming from the, the point of view that if supersymmetry is expected to be exact, we should see in nature particles inside uh, particles in uh, the superparticles uh, with the same mass as your respective partner in the standard model. For example, if I, if supersymmetry would be exact, I should see a S electron, as a, the, part, the super partner of the electron, having the same mass as the electron particle of the standard model. But we, we don't see that. So what makes us understand that supersymmetry is a broken symmetry? So, but we need to think a mechanism to break symmetry. And one of these mechanisms available is the hidden sector mechanism. I mean, in the picture on the left, you can see that a hidden sector and physical sector. In hidden, supersymmetry would be broken in the hidden sector and always its effects would be transmitted propagating for a physical sector where the, the particle of the standard model in the MSCM content would be would be uh, filling this this breaking and in, in this way it particle of the super uh, symmetric spectrum would be mass difference from the standard model sector so the, the, the minimal extension of the standard model, the minimal supersymmetric extension, um, has 140 independent parameters, being 19 parameters come from the standard model and 105 of the SUSY model. So this amount, this large amount of parameters inside the, 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 this main minimal extension come from the fact that we have Squared masses, slepto masses, CP violation phase, trilinear couplings. This, all these parameters together make up these numbers. Also, um, as in the standard model, as I showed previously, we have a Lagrangian that describes all the interactions and couplings. In the mini minimal extension, also we have this Lagrangian. And and all the all the the in in the, the, the general form to this Lagrangian is constant with the standard model gauge group. It means the minimal extension of the standard model in supersymmetry has also the same group of symmetry. SU three SU three cross SU two cross uh, cross U one. Also, this Lagrangian uh, should should be consistent with baryonic and leptonic loss conservation. But uh, supersymmetry also has a uh, um, um, multiplicative number that imposed called R parity, as you can see in this expression, where B stands for the baryon number, L stands for the lepton number, yes, for the spin of particle. Particles of the standard model has R parity plus one, and particles in um, supersymmetric uh, context, uh, supersymmetric context has spin, uh, sorry, spin node R as parity minus one. 
this invariance will get, give will uh, lead us to in, in, important uh, considerations. For example, the candidate for the dark matter. On the next slide, uh, sorry, sorry, it's still in this slide. Um, what I mean for this will lead us to the to the uh, dark matter candidate. Where our parity is conserved in the scenarios that our parity is conserved, we'll have the lightest supersymmetric particle of the SUSE model being stable. And also, when this symmetry is broken, this the lightest supersymmetric particle will not more stable. Can now in this case, in this scenario, this particle can decay. <clears throat> Now, um, so as you can, as you, as we saw previously, we have a lot of parameters in the minimal extension to handle. What make what of the point of view of the phenomenology is very complicated. So, this way, one thing is uh, that was real, uh, realized. Uh, what is performed is the work with the constrained uh, minimal standard model, minimal, constrained minimal supersymmetric standard model. What it basically means? What means that um, with with this this universal universality universality assumption, where we put so the software breaks uh, in a grand unification scale. We can reduce that that large number of parameters to a small number. In this case, five parameters, where m zero is the common mass for the lepton quarks and Higgs bosons. M one half is the common mass for Gigi genus and Higgs genus. A zero is the three linear couplings. The tan beta is the expected value of the vac uh, expected viv vacuum value developed for the Higgs. Uh, is the ratio for the expected vacuum values between the Higgs bosons. And the sign of mu is the Higgs Higgsian mass parameter. So there are many constraint models. For example, for example, M sugar that stands for minimal supersymmetric model mediated by gravity and GMSB, gauge mediated supersymmetric breaking. On the left, on the right, I show you a plot that you can see. This is a plot for a M sugar scenario where, where you can see the spectrum of particles, you can see the particles in your at respective spin on the in the column on the left and on the right you can see another column the particles within spin mail you can see also in the full red circle the standard model higgs standard model like higgs also as the this was this this this, this spectrum was built for a m sugar scenario so basically in this scenario you see that uh, the the benchmark point is two three. What basically means that this is a point in the parameter space, space par parameter space, uh, based on in the five parameters that I mentioned previously. Um, in this scenario, our parity is conserved. What means that the lightest supersymmetric particle is the neutralino, is the last the last particle, the green particle on the left column in the plot. Um, in the next slide, okay, we have, um, oh, sorry. Also in this plot, we can see that the uh, dashed line, this dashed line means that the decay chain of this particles. In, so basically you can see the, um, the more uh, energetic 
or massive particles in this case is the green what the what the, this way is, is unstable and the case in squarks that the case in charginos and then the case in sleptons and then in neutralinos so okay we see a a, a theoretical scenario but how the would be the signatures for these scenarios in experiments Wh which kind of signature we expect from from this kind of scenario so in the next slides i show you one of these the standard signature for supersymmetry basically here you can see a cascade of the decay basically in the lhc you have proton-proton collisions. You have the production of colored particles, gluinos and squarks, or gluinos, gluinos, or squarks, squarks. The gluinos then decay in a jet, in a, in a quark, in a squark, and then the squark decay in a chargino and in a, in, in a, and a quark, and the chargino is instead unstable the NDK in a neutralino in leptons. So the presence of these particles is measured in the in experiments like uh, CMS or Atlas or LHB or D0, looking at the observables. The, for example, in full in the full um, green circle you can see a neutralino neutralino is some uh in the context of the experiment are particles that don't interact is, interact with the uh goes and goes uh without the uh interact with the detector so are particles in a certain way uh, like neutrinos don't interact with interact very weakly with with the matter not let any response in the detector so your presence is inferred as a quantity called missing e missing et that stands for missing transverse energy so this quantity basically is calculated making the conserv making considerations in the moment of conservation so basically you you sum the amount of momentum before and before the the the, the process and in after the, the 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 decay and when you have a, a presence of the a particle that uh, neutrino neutrino or neutralino you said that um, amount of energy is carry it's carried without the presence of this particle basically this is an indication of a presence of a, a, neutri a neutrino or neutralino in supersymmetric scenarios uh, and then this um, is uh, missing it is defined also you have leptons that is also measured you can measure leptons and also quarks uh, you because of the chromodynamic principles you can see quarks the free quarks what you see is a production uh, it's a hadronization of a quark and leptons okay of, yes leptons you can measure free freely so then this way the, the standard SUSE signature is along the decay of chain if the r parity is conserved you you in the final of the chain you see a neutralino the lsp lightest supersymmetric particle and then we will have a large amount of missing transverse energy you will have also high energetic jets and you can have or not depending of the decay leptons in the chain okay so 
in the next slide, okay, I give, uh, okay. Now, okay, we, we see how is a typical signature for supersymmetry, but how we can, how we can measure these properties? Yes, we need experiment. In our case, we use, we, we use the compact mu solenoid experiment. The compact mu solenoid, mu solenoid is basically is a, a large experiment where you have, um, where uh, the main feature is your powerful field, magnetic field of 3.8 3 Tesla, where permit uh, what allow us measure the, the tracking, the track of the particles and identify the primary and sec secondary vertices with high, with, with a good resolution. Be also because this um, large magnetic field, you can measure the moment, measure precisely the measure, the moment of the particles. Also, as you have uh, detectors uh, uh, with the, Tra the good tracking and the mean chambers in out mean chambers uh, in the in the CMS you have you can uh, with this subsystem together have a good measure of of the tracks of led by muons and its and your respective momentum. Also, we can measure with a good resolution the energy in the tracks for electrons and photons. Um, we can, we have a good, uh, also a good uh, hadronic uh, color to measure the presence of the jets. But basically this is the main of features for CMS. So basically, as I told you in the, pre in the previous slide, the signature also, the, um, you can measure lap, uh, leptons in the inner tracking in the very most inner region of the detector we can we can measure the jets with the hadronic calorimeter information and the uh, tracker information we can measure the energy in the and the uh, and, and measure, me, me, measuring precisely this amount, these quantities, these, ob, these object, objects, we can then also infer uh, the missing transverse energy. So in the next slide, then, okay, we have a typical signature, you have an experiment. So, in these years of, of uh, working of the CMS, many certs were performed. So basically in this slide, I show you also a few examples of them. For example, MET plus JETS plus one lepton, MET plus JETS and zero lepton, MET plus photons, final state with multi leptons, stop production with single lepton fine state, jet plus met with a special uh, variable in, called razor. But the question is, um, we found Susie with these certs or some hint of, of it? No, the answer is no. It, we haven't seen any hint of Susie so far, but why? This is the next question we can do. Why why didn't see Sus then? And then it's it, it's bring us for the next slide, where where I I, I can say you okay there hope to Suzy there is still room for Suzy. The thoughts or hypothesis why we didn't have seen Sus is maybe in fact nature is not super symmetric. Or the cross sections for the SUSE process is very small. Or SUSE particle masses are out of the LHC range. Or all of these standard certs are looking at a 
uh, in a in a scenario that not correspond to possible SUSE decays. I mean, this all these standard search could be not sensitive to the SUSE processes. But as the the title of this slide says, as there's this true room for SUSE, and this. And this is in this very narrow region on the left plot. This plot basically is a plot from a standard search. I mean, I think it's multi jets with, um, I, got, I don't know if it's exactly multi jets plus mat, but it's multi jets. And uh, basically is a exclu exclusion mass plot that basically um, the, you are comparing the observed data, the observed, that means the data, with the expected, what is expected by theory. And you compare this and from that you can exclude, okay, I can exclude the gluinos with mass below this, right, below this value and neutralino below this value. So, the fact that there's this true room for SUSE is, uh, and particularly for what brings for my work, resides in this very narrow region where you have a compressed mass between neutralinos and gluinos. And this is compressed because if you remember from the previous, from the previous plots, from the Previous plot from Amy Sugar scenario, you can see that uh, is a small difference. Sorry, is a large difference in mass between the 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 lightest supersymmetric particle and the gluino, the uh, more um, uh, heaviest particle. But in this case, you can see we have the opposite we have a small uh, scenario where uh, a compressed mass between these two particles um, are seen are, i see uh, basically then is a, the, this is the 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 first look at a, a, a possible direction for supersymmetry and this and this uh what this ana in this analysis that focuses in this compressed scenario is developed here for me and uh, and other people in in uh, member um, in a joint group member um, from CBPF and Dwerge. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so in the next slide we can see exactly what means this compressed SUSE scenario, what we base on. The, in the compressed SUSE scenario, we have, uh, as I told you, a small difference, a small mass difference between the gluinos and neutralinos. In the, le in the right, in the, on the left uh, picture, I show three, dif three, uh, three different scenarios, compressed scenarios. The first one where the gluinos are are out of the elite range has a ma uh, are very mass very massive, and you have a small di mass difference between squarks and the LSP. This difference mass is between one and one hundred GeV. In the B, you have also uh, a compressed scenario where the now squarks are out of their elite range, and you have a compressed scenario between gluino and LSP. And you can also have a degenerate scenario where you have the gluino and LSP and squarks. So the motivation for, for our analysis that we will describe soon is based in this scenario, where we have the squarks disaccoupled of the, of the C range and the mass difference is, is small between gluinos and LSP. Uh, so, if it's supersymmetry, 
it resides in compressed uh, compressed scenarios. The standard search approach is not more accurate to me, to see this here. We need to to look at look at up look up in other for look uh, looking for other strategies. So the gluino um, decay. As I to, uh, in a in a compressed scenario, okay, you have a small mass difference between the gluino and the LSP. In this case, neutralino. Uh, the gluino particle then can decay through the through the um, the process indicated. Gluino can decay in a quark, quark, uh, antiquark. Then this decay is mediated via, via a offshore quark, high massive with high mass, and then this virtual quark decay is in a quark and a neutralino. If the if you, you are in a R parity conserved scenario, the neutralino is stable. So on the left, I I, I show you the, the expressions to the the green decay rate, and you can see this, the rate dec depends on the Gugino fraction, but that basically means um, what, uh, neut as I told you, neutralino, neutralinos are mixture from other supersymmetrical particles like photinos, hexinos, winos, binos. So this parameter, Gugino fraction, is, t is telling us how percentage of a uh, of a fotino or a higzino or um, um, or other as other yes basically is telling us uh, which what is the percent of uh, percentage of uh, higzino or a uh, fotino or a uh, bino or a wino that compose the neutralino. And also, this rate depends on the difference mass between the gluino and neutralino and the quark mass, as you can see. So, uh, also, through this expression, we can find the gluino lifetime. What basically uh, is the inverse of the gluino decay rate as as you can see if um, for a given fixed difference mass between the gluino and neutralino and varying the quark masses we can see the lifetime is proportional what means the higher the quark mass higher is the lifetime of the gluino um okay so uh give having um uh, keeping in mind these expressions we can we can take a look we can study study the behaviors behind this relation between these variables okay so we can see now the following plots for the lifetime of the gluino versus the quark mass. You can see that um, for high quark masses, uh, you have a higher, the gluino lifetime is very significant, is high. We can also see that for, um, um, for large difference masses, the lifetime, decrease as we can infer through uh, through that uh, expressions because these plots are resulted from the, the previous expressions okay now also in, interesting to see how the gino fraction and the branch ratio of the gluino are connected the branch ratio basically is a quanti uh, is a is a is a ratio that um, 
you you can you pick up the 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 width for a particular decay it, and divide it by the total decay. And with this, we will get a value from this rate. We will get a value that that says to you, ah, okay, uh, the percentage of the of the the decay of the, that particular process in the to, in, over the total. So then uh, we can see that for uh, large uh, for large gluino fraction, the neutralino in this case is basically gaussino like. Or I mean, it's composed for from winos. Spinos for or maybe for chinos. and for small gauge fractions, the the neutralino is most like composed for from higginos, and also you can notice that in a comp for uh, in when neutralino uh, is most is most gaussian like we can see we have a, a large branching ratio. So, keeping looking at, at this relation in the lifetime, the significant lifetime for the neutralinos and mass difference in the green mass, we can see that this plot basically are displaying the, the, the decay length versus the mass difference. The, between the gluino and neutralino, the decay length is another is another property uh, that means that uh, basically is the average distance travel traveled by a particle before decaying. So, if you glu if gluino is uh, with gluino's long life having a life a significant lifetime, the gluino will not decay promptly but will travel some distance. And while the green travel some, uh, some distance, they will form a, a QCD bound state, bound state called R hadrons. That is basically a state where you have the green with another quarks of the standard model form a, a bound state neutral colored. <clears throat> so with this life, the this with this lifetime, uh, uh, with with gluino forming this state and traveling, you will not see the gluino in the primary vertex. What means this in the vertex in the of the collision? But we will see a secondary vertex, some distance apart from the primary vertex. What, so what, what means that if the green is long-lived, it's formed the R-hadrons and it decays at a secondary vertex. As I show you the, prior, the previous, in this slide, the, the, in this Feynman diagram, the green will decay in a lighter supersymmetrical part, in this case, neutralino, in this scenario, these two jet in two jets, soft jets. Why soft jets? Because we have now a scenario where the difference mass between green and the train is small, and and what and with it we impl implies that your final state will 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 very soft. This is why we have these two soft jets. And also, these particles that compose this R hadron uh, will form additional extremely soft jets. Basically, then, what this plot is telling us is is the behavior between is the behavior between the decay length versus the mass difference. We can see that for a small mass difference, we have a significant uh, decay length for the gluino. The comparison here is from the theory 
and the Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so from what I have shown for you, we can uh, we can keep in looking at the the uh, in the motivations for supersymmetry. Uh, we work now. We also work with a simplified model. What basically means that uh, uh, from from a compressed scenario, we have some parameters that the main ones is the the gluon mass and the mass difference between between gluon and neutralino. The other parameters will be fixed, like squark mass. We'll fix the 40 TV scale. The Higgs mass not developed uh, some, uh, uh, no, not play a, a, a role in our search, but we will keep fixed in um, 100 GV mass. And the LCP in this case is mainly is mainly Gaugino. As I show in the in a, in this previous plot, we can see that if the LCP is mainly Gaugino, you have a large um, a considerable significant branching ratio compared with if the Gauge, the uh, neutralino is composed from a Higgsino. So, also, um, for, for study the simplified mode scenario, uh, we generate uh, some, some points, some Monte Carlo points, some simulated points. These points are when gluon mass has 250, 500, 750, and 1000 GeV mass, and the difference mass between neutralino and uh, gluino is 40, 60, 80, and 100 GV. So, as you can see in the diagram, the Feynman diagram, you have the gluino production from PP collisions, and you have then the hadronization, how jets are seen in the detectors. So, from this, we, it's used two Monte Carlo generators. The first, in the first step, might graph to gluino, gluino production. And in the second step, the, uh, the pithia, pithia generate for gluino production and hadronization of the jets. Okay, now I show you all the, the motivation for, our comp for this compressed search. Now it's time to see our signature. Our signature is displayed in the picture on the left. You can see uh, gluino production, and then gluino forms our hadrons decay in a secondary vertex with two jets and a neutralino. Um, the, the basically uh, signature then is a moderate amount of missing ET coming from the LCP. Neutralino, um, a secondary a secondary vertex with two jets because you have the gluino gluino uh, how the how gluino has a significant lifetime. It's form a hard hadron decaying a secondary vertex. And also, as the as in a compressed scenario, you have a very soft final state. This becomes very difficult for trigger the events. So we require the a hard ice a ISR jet. What means ISR jet? Basically means initial state radiation. Is some kind of partons emitted emitted in the initial state radiation, in this case in the production. For uh, the preselection requirements for this for this kind of signature are we, we require events passing MET trigger with 100 GV threshold. In this kind of uh, signature, we don't have leptons because as you can see um, from the preview di Feynman diagram and from the this picture, we don't have leptons in the chain. 
we require at least one primary vertex with at least one jet with PT above 150 GV. We require at least one secondary vertex with, with at least two jets with PT larger than 30 GV. And a die jet mass coming from the secondary vertex larger than above 16 GV. So, and then this is the, the signature of for the compressed scenario. The, comp the signature will we, we work. Um, okay. So, but we have okay uh, in inside in LHC collisions we have uh, a forty mega uh, a rate of forty megahertz events being produced, which means 40, 40, uh, 40, uh, 40, 40 millions of uh, collisions per second, which means as amount of events being uh, coming from the several processes. So many of these processes could, in a certain way, imitate our signature. And this is one of the, the biggest steps in analysis to know how these processes the, that imitates our signature behaves. These processes are called backgrounds. For, for our signature, the main sources of background are Tit jets. Why tit jets is is uh, a source? As you can see, the tit jets. You have jets. You can see jets here. You can see neutrinos. As I told you previously, the missing transverse energy quantity is a quantity that you infer from uh, is associated with the presence of the neutrinos and in supersymmetrical scenarios, neutralinos. So, you have then quarks and met in a TT jets processes. Also, W plus jets processes. You have also missing ET and jets. The same is in Z, jet, in Z plus jets events. But then, yes. Where in this case, the Z can decay in a lepton and and lepton. If Z decays invisible, what I mean for invisible, if Z decay promptly in, uh, in neutrinos, you have a final state for Z plus jets with MET plus the jets. Also with other background is QCD, MET jets, Z decay invisible, uh, I already told you. Single top, where basically is uh, is the di Feynman diagram for TT jets with just one part, and other small contributions. Okay, so one part, one big part of the analysis is to know exactly how the background behaves. So. So briefly, I will give idea how a background can, can be studied. There are many viable methods on the marketing and they use it. Um, for example, if you are uh, for QCD backgrounds, we can use the ABC method to estimate. The ABC method basically uh, is a method that um, requires that you find the two uncorrelated variables, what uh, two uh, variables that uh, are may independent, and uh, you will, uh, f uh, you, you will, with these two variables, find two regions, the ABC re ABCD, and each region, one he region will be the, um, the signal, and the other regions, the background. And then you can find the number of events of QCD 
calculating a, ra a, a ratio of these number of events. Uh, another uh, method is the transfer, transfer factor method that can be used for estimate TT plus jet and W plus jet backgrounds. This will, I will explain in more detail in the next slide. Also, you can have the, the, a method called dileptons to estimate the Z in invisible plus jets. But when you, the first thing when you start to look at to estimate a background, you, you need to understand the, uh, and, and propose a contravision. What it means? If you have um, uh, the contour regions are regions that you define, uh, basically are some requirements, some cuts you require, and in a certain way that in that region, your background that you are targeting will be dominant, and the other sources of backgrounds, such uh, if I will estimate uh, TT jets, my background, my TT jets should be dominant in this country region, and my other source of background as W plus jets or cubes, this should be sm uh, as small as possible. Also, the signal for my the, for my signature also should be small. So, in this in this slide, I explain quickly. <clears throat> the idea for the transfer transfer factor method for estimate TT plus jets. The cont the control region or, or it, the requirements are we require events firing the met trigger, uh, events uh, with at least one lepton with PT above 15 GeV, events with at least two data with PT above 20 GeV and a pseudo rapidity less 2.4 at least two quarks B jets with PT above 30 GV and MET above 200, 210 GV. The idea for the transfer method, transfer method is basically first, define your control region. After that, calculate the purity of this control region. A good, a good control region give a, give a purity above 80%. So, the expression to calculate the purity, for example, when estimating the tip T plus jet is, you, f you calculate, you find the number of expected events for TTT plus jets, and divide this over all the expected background and TT plus jets. Also, I just uh, would like to remind you that this is, in the, uh, is done in a Monte Carlo simulation. So after that, after you check that you have a good control region, your purity is high, you can find the trans, the trans factor calculating the number of events in the signal region uh, divided by the number of events found in a control region. So what this result give you is the it, it's how to get the number of events the TT jets in the signal region. It's basically you are correcting your Monte Carlo for your signal region. Okay. The uh, the next idea I will give you is the idea of this developed for the trigger efficiency estimation. So. Uh, in CMS, we have two, two, le two trigger levels. The first level is, uh, is, is known as level one trigger. Is, uh, the, is the first trigger that selected the, these high rates coming from the collisions. It's, it's used the, in a hardware. You have some, uh, in, in this case, in, for this level, you have uh, some, uh, some some triggers that come from uh, primitive quantities, and then you make a, a half a halfly reconstruction and selection of the events to reduce the amount rate coming from the collisions. Then you have the HOT higher level trigger that works in software level. 
the higher level trigger is more precise than L1 because it works with uh, a high effic efficient uh, algorithm to reconstruction called uh, particle flow. And this, and uh, there, and we, you have a menu of several triggers with with for the several uh, propose analysis propose, and then you can reduce this this rate uh, for one for order of one hundred hertz, and then you can store this data. But okay, uh, from these two level of the triggers, um, and as I told you, have uh, several triggers path. Depending on the direction of your analysis, you can use uh, particular triggers. So, but it's necessary to know in in uh, offline analysis how the efficiency is for this particular trigger. Why this is why the trigger estimate trigger efficiency estimation is important. So I, I give you here some few region, reasons for that. Um, you, it's 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 necessary to measure the trigger in a, um, um, ah sorry, before you measure the trigger efficiency, um, you you have you have to keep in mind uh, that to measure the trigger efficiency, the, uh, that the conditions in offline analysis should be close as possible of the online conditions because you you the proposal you get it's get the the true efficiency the efficiency that uh, were developed in on, uh, online level uh it's it's important to measure the trigger efficiency because you need to know how exactly the trigger performance in select the, that kind of events you are looking for also you need to know where exactly the you have a good a uh, high efficiency is possible or where the plateau of the of the the, the trigger ter curve uh, starts and from that you you will, you will be able to decide about the cuts over the offline and offline variables there are many uh, methods available for trigger if estimation for example counting method orthogonal method and tag and probe and other ones but this is some kind of the main the no ones so i will be i will give a quickly uh, idea of the orthogonal method the idea here is basically um, uh, use uh, the met trigger, as I, I showed previously. The the met trigger is one of the is the first requirement for our signature, for our preselection. So I want to measure the 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 if the trigger the trigger efficiency for this kind of path the met trigger. So the orthogonal met is based on basically you first need to select an uh, unbiased sample. What it means that basically if you if you uh, calculate the efficiency with your trigger directly, you can uh, give in a bias for the efficiency result. But in a such way that uh, gets um, distance is as possible of a bias we uh, prepare an unbiased sample this is prepared using a orthogonal trigger additional trigger why orthogonal because this trigger has properties that are independent of your target trigger so in this case uh, for the estimate the curve shown on left the orthogonal trigger was a single le electron trigger and as i told you the target trigger here is a met trigger with a threat of 100 170 gv basically then you calculate the efficiency for this trigger as expressed for this brief expression 
the number of events firing the single electron and the match trigger divide by the number ah sorry mm, the denominator of this expression should 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 be a uh, single electron trigger it's a mistake it's a typo sorry but then the efficiency is the number of events firing that a single electron and match trigger over the single electron trigger on the left then you can see the efficiency plot efficiency um, curve behavior you can see that uh, and also you can see the there is this red curve that that is a fitted curve for this this efficiency curve you can see basically here um, the central value that in a is in a that is if we had um, if we had not uh, some bias in a ide ideal way the central value should correspond exactly to the trigger threshold but as we have some bias it's very difficult to eliminate uh, the the bias completely always we have some kind of bias some kind of interference so in this case the central value for this this trigger star uh, is 207 what means that uh, it's a bit larger than the the threshold of the trigger path so basically then so far i give you um some ideas of um i did i give you some ideas of how how is the signature for this for this search developed for us i give you i gave you some um some uh, overview of how the background our background can be estimated and how our trigger uh, efficiency can be estimated what brings me for uh, not a conclusion but a summary where basically then i have shown that the standard model is very successful in the screen in your in your prediction because um they they were seen in the experiment but some questions are not addressed and uh, but in the supersymmetric scenarios these, ex these open questions are addressed ad addressed what makes supersymmetry very act act attractive for treating these standard model flaws also uh, as, as seeing many search standard search was developed, but any any one of them gave gave us a hint of supersymmetry, but put put uh, some limits on the um, on the masses of the supersymmetric particles. But the hunt is ongoing. Now we in this in this year we start the second part of the run two for CMS and all other experiments and mainly from CMS and Atlas in the content in the SUSE scenario this is a it, it's been very exciting so also we we saw that there's two room for for supersymmetry and this room come comes from for our scenario there can be others but uh, I focused on our scenarios that compress the search in soft jets plus mat plus displaced vertex where is a joint group uh, member from cbpf and where sorry for the typo here where we have the this um the group as i shown here the professor casting prof professor uh, elena matias van me george fernando in Gilson. So this uh, analysis is ongoing. What uh, um, lets us to know that uh, there are most interesting and exciting things to come. Most, uh, most um, work to do and uh, most to expect. Um, 
yes, basically is that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, uh, Common. Maybe I may see this uh, in this conference with this scenario. What happens with the charging? Are they decoupled? What? Charging. Can you give them? Who is who is asking? Hello? Clemencia. Clemencia? Ah, hi. Uh, what is the question? Sorry, can you re can repeat, please? Ah, Clemencia. Hello? I'm, I'm not listening anything, sorry. Could you uh, put the answer in the QA? Maybe, and I can reply. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear? Ah, now I can. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, what's the question? Um, if the charginos were decoupled in a compressed system scenario. Uh, were charginos? Yeah, the, well, ah, ah, what, what, uh, the, uh, what the role of the charging in compressed scenarios? Yeah. Ah, okay. So, uh, um, uh, let me think. So, I I think um, in a in a compressed scenario, um, I, I think. We, um, I think, could be have some terginos, but uh, but um, no, no, Fabio, they are also decoupled, they are heavier than the Duinos in this case. No, but I think I think it uh, her question was in a, not in this in uh, in was in most general aspect. Yes, considering our analysis, uh, it, it, yes, it's out. It's also decoupled. The only decay possible is the gluino and it being the have the heaviest particle and the neutralino being the lightest supersymmetric particle. I don't know if you replied reply your question, Clemens. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Thanks. And uh, Fabio. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Hi, Elena. That there are so many steps until we finish the analysis. Would you mind like outlining them really quickly? What are the steps that still need to be done so we can finish this analysis? Uh, 
Ah, uh, our analysis. Yes. Yes. Um, there. Yes. There are uh, much things to do. As for example, uh, I'm currently working in uh, trigger estimation and physics. There are some some uh, some work to do yet. Um, there are some work in to do for estimate uh, our background sources. Some of them are being estimated, but the others, for example, t jets, um, uh, QCD, uh, IW project are being estimated, but uh, um, I think um, the plus jets in invisible chain is still missing to be estimated. Uh, we need to also take a look in our uh, systematic uncertainties. Um, Um, yes, this is what I remember for now to outline that. Yeah, it's, it's still a lot of things that are on the list. That's true. Yes. Okay. They have another Yes. Uh, you know this, um, this access that was observed uh, in dipole on uh, environment mass of 750 GB. Do you think it's possible that that actually comes from the Ah, these, these, um, okay, you are talking about the, the latest result of, uh, the earlier of the run two, right? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, it's a good question, but I'll see, it, it, I, I think it's, could be possible come from supersymmetry because yeah first because it's something beyond standard model and a particle that originated this kind of uh, final state as was discussed uh, has a high mass yes maybe maybe it's possible and I hope it 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 will it would be it would be seen, it would be very nice <laughs> to start with this new for Susie. Which supersymmetric particles do you think it could be this resonance? Sorry? So which supersymmetric particle do you think could correspond to this resonance? The resonance in the dipole zone. Mm. Possible resonance, right? It's, uh, it's just a slight access. Uh, good question, Clemencia. Good, <laughs> good question. So, um, if we take uh, looking at the standard supersymmetry scenarios, um, it's because I, I don't remember what kind of a supersymmetric scenario could be, which kind of supersymmetric particle could be could be originate a dye photon. But um, um, but it should be ah, maybe why not what yes but uh, yes may, why not a uh, a supersymmetric Higgs maybe yeah could be could be why not it, it could be um, yes a candidate maybe a supersymmetric Higgs because we know that uh, from the run one that the Higgs was one of the the channels that the Higgs was discovered was Higgs decaying to photons, final state. I would say that. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. This is actually something uh, we would like to we would like to have a presentation on this two four one final state here in the, in the seminar mm -hmm. because there are so many. Uh, that I try to explain the the, the the resonance there that we might like to have some. Yeah, yesterday I was just having a, a, a fast look at the entire mm -hmm. repository and. Over 300 yeah, papers. Yeah.
kind of planet. So that will be something uh, we hope that we can convince the students to, to, from the theory from summarize the most. You know, there is a theory yeah. book that was the uh, yeah. other way to yeah. There was this guy that we had to the top. Okay. Um, hmm? yeah. There are no more questions. It's already kind of late. Um, they, um, we close the session here. Thank you again, Fabio. That was a very nice presentation. Um, quick advertisement for the next seminar that takes place June 3rd. I okay. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and thank you for the questions and I miss you everyone. <laughs> See you soon. All right, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. On June 3rd we have the uh, the Python presentation which I'm going to put together. And then on June 17th um, we have Petra Huntemeyer from Michigan Tech. She works on the Hawk experiment in Mexico, and she will talk about cosmic ray physics at Hawk. And then for July, all the talks are open. Uh, you're more than welcome to, to um, volunteer. Well, thank you very much, everyone, and I uh, hope to see you then in the beginning of June. Bye bye. Thank you. No, I'm just saying, I mean, I'm just saying, 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 I'm